The Patanjali Yoga Sutras are very well-known text on yoga. A lot of people are under the impression that it was Patanjali who invented yoga because of this text. However, he was the author and compiler of these sutras or this yoga text. He did not invent yoga. Yoga existed long before Patanjali, who himself is a bit of a mystery. So he merely synthesized that knowledge and put it together in a systematic manner. Who was Patanjali? No one is really sure whether this was a person, one person, or whether it was a family, a lineage, uh, a family of, of teachers. It was often done in those days that one did not take credit for a book or a work, but put the name of the family or even the teacher on it. So it is not clear who exactly Patanjali was. The book or the text was is from, from around 2,000 years ago in... It is compiled of 130, 196 sutras. These sutras are nothing other than pithy statements or sayings. They are short lines. You can imagine that when you attend a class and you take notes, it's not easy to take notes while the teacher is speaking. So, what do you do? You make points. You make short points capturing the essence of what the teacher is said. And this is what the Yoga Sutras are. There are 196 short statements which are connected to each other. Like a thread that's what sutra means. Sutra is a thread. And this 196 sutras or statements are linked together. And we must try to understand this reasoning or this link behind these separate statements. For our purpose today, I have chosen out of these 196 sutras, 74 sutras. And this collection is called the Essential Patanjali Yoga Sutras. That's what I call it. And the reason for this is that some of the later sutras are quite difficult to follow. And there is a grave danger that the entire discussion becomes completely intellectual. I have chosen 74 sutras which provide great insight into the path of meditation, into the mysteries of the mind. And they're very useful for those who wish to practice. Or those who are practicing. The Yoga Sutras are very, very useful. It is unfortunate that these sutras or this text is probably one of the most misunderstood texts that we have in the yoga tradition. 
I believe it is so misunderstood because the translators of this text and the commentators of this text have, are just scholars. They are not practitioners. They are not coming from living traditions. They are scholars who have studied this from an academic perspective. They have translated something that they do not really understand. And the commentators as well have been primarily scholars. For this reason, this text is one of the most misunderstood texts and we find here commentaries on the commentaries on the commentaries and each one more complicated than the other. This was the reason that I was inspired to translate these sutras myself and whilst I did that I found that it is practically impossible to translate these sutras without the meaning of it getting lost. So what we have is a transliteration. I have kept the meaning of these sutras in such a way that people can understand that in a modern English and not in a very difficult scholarly or academic English. I have tried to use simple English so that everyone can understand this. This subject has already been made very difficult and I have tried to simplify it, not oversimplify it, but keep in it its essential simplicity and not to complicate it further. There was another issue that I faced when I translated this and that was that to, to translate it into modern English they did not remain in these short little pithy statements. So I have clubbed some of the sutras together so that they make sense together. If I would have made them into pithy statements, it would have again been very difficult to follow. I have made great effort to keep this translation also in the spirit of a living tradition, which springs from direct experience and contemplation. It is not written with the intention of creating a scholarly work. It is not written with the intention of showing off, off how clever I am. And I am not trying to create some sort of analysis. All I have tried to do is to communicate these wonderful teachings to sincere seekers and meditators in the simplest and easiest possible way. For whom are these Yoga Sutras? It has become fashionable in modern yoga studios for modern students of physical culture to learn these Yoga Sutras by heart. It's a part of teacher's training programs and so they learn it without any understanding of it. They merely learn a sort of an overview. They learn a couple of sutras by heart, but they do not really know what it means since they have no experience in meditation whatsoever. There are others who enjoy intellectual gymnastics and they like to participate in debates. And these people also like to study the Yoga Sutras because they find them challenging. However, this translation and this commentary is not for these people. It is 
suitable for those who have a deep desire to have a direct experience of yoga as meditation. And experience the Yoga Sutras as taught in a living, unbroken tradition of meditators and to use these as a tool to deepen their practice. You will find, uh, this is a PDF, which you will also find on our site, that first dot com that minus first dot com and you can download it it's a free download and it's a 14 page pdf document i personally find that since the yoga sutras by nature tend to be difficult especially the latter part that it is very useful to just read a couple of paragraphs of it maybe in the evening at night before bedtime and then the unconscious mind sort of soaks it in and it is integrated in your mind in this manner rather than trying to intellectually study it and struggle with it I find that has been a much more useful way of reading the yoga sutras For a brief overview of the sutras themselves, they are divided into four chapters. And the very first chapter begins with the Samadhi Pada, that is the section on Samadhi. You would ask yourself, what kind of yoga text is this that starts with Samadhi? The highest, the acme of meditation that goal that we all want to attain. Why does one start with Samadhi? This mystery is further compounded by the very first Sutra itself, which says, Ataha Yoga Anusashanam. Ataha means now. There have been a great deal of intellectual discussions by academic scholars about the significance of this one Sanskrit word, ataha. Ataha means now. The scholars claim this is somehow a philosophical interpretation and is supposed to indicate a state of meditation that you should be present in the now, be here and now. There are many such interpretations of Ataha and why these sutras start with the word now and why the sutras start with a chapter on Samadhi. Well, <clears throat> If you discuss something with anybody and having finished discussion, you would say, and now listen to me. That now implies that something happened before. Now, in any conversation or any piece of writing indicates that something was explained before and now we are explaining further. This might imply that there have been texts before this which were lost or being a part of a living tradition it may indicate that the student was already explained certain things before and now we go on to the study of Samadhi. So what is it that happened before? 
For whom is this text? We said already. This text is for those who are meditators, who want to explore the mind, study it, not intellectually, but through meditation, get a direct experience. So, it is clear that if we are now coming to Samadhi, that the student has already had some experience, has an experience of a state close to Samadhi, a state which has so completely changed his or her view of life that he or she is now ready to explore the mind and understand it directly as well as through guidance, through external guidance. With this background in mind, the text begins Samadhipada with the first four sutras explaining what is yoga. Is yoga physical gymnastics? Is yoga a kind of a religion? Is yoga some sort of a wellness? Is yoga a philosophy, an intellectual philosophy? None of these. The first four sutras explain what is yoga. When a high state of consciousness is attained, where thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires naturally and spontaneously subside, without any forceful suppression, this state is called yoga. When this occurs, pure consciousness shines forth and you know you are one with the infinite, infinite whole, a wave of bliss and beauty in this vast ocean of consciousness. At all other times, however, we are disturbed by our thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires and we identify ourselves with these, mistaking our thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires for ourselves when in fact we are none other than pure consciousness. So the first four sutras explain that yoga is when thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires naturally and spontaneously subside. They have not been suppressed, they just naturally subside. And when that occurs, pure consciousness shines forth. And you know you are one with that infinite whole. We may not have experienced that state if you have, maybe it was just for a few moments. But those few moments are enough to make you begin to question the world, the nature of the world, the purpose of your life, who you are, all these profound questions. And that is the student who can take up the study of the Yoga Sutras, the one who has had some insight into a higher state of consciousness and who wants to know himself. We all are familiar with the state that we are in most of the times, where we are disturbed by our thoughts and mental images, by emotions and desires, we are continuously identifying ourselves with these and we mistake ourselves for our thoughts. Even though we are not our thoughts, we are pure consciousness. But we do not identify with pure consciousness. We identify with our thoughts. If our thoughts are bad, we think we are bad. If our thoughts are good, we think we are good. 
and in this manner we suffer. Any questions so far? In that case, we continue. You see how fast the Yoga Sutras go to the heart of the matter. It has already explained what is Yoga and it has explained the nature of your mind at all other times, which is our general state. And now it, is, it explains how you can disidentify form your thoughts, form your mental images, emotions and desires. So the sutras 5 to 11 explain how to uncolor your thoughts, how to disidentify from your thoughts. Thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires Disturb us like ripples disturb the clear surface of a lake. So your mind is like a lake. And these ripples are some mental images, some emotions, some thoughts, some desires. And all these ripples are of twofold nature. But of two kinds. They are colored, known as klishta, or not colored, which is a klishta. Colored thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires are those that lead us to the false belief that worldly objects give us everlasting pleasure. These colored thoughts, feelings and desires cause us to mistake misery for happiness, to regard our body and mind as our true nature and leads us away from pure consciousness. And we continue to strengthen and perpetuate this false belief through all our thoughts and actions. And then there are the very wonderful not colored or eklishta thoughts. These are not colored thoughts, images, emotions and desires and these lead us away from this false system, belief system and they promote the direct nature of our true nature which is nothing other than pure consciousness. So what are colored thoughts, mental images. It's things like attachment, which makes us suffer. And we think that attachment to our family gives us everlasting pleasure. We, we encourage this, we promote this attachment. We say it is very important to have a family, to be to raise a family, to, and we focus on strengthening our relationships. Because we have this false belief that this is what will give us everlasting happiness or pleasure. The same is with pleasures regarding the body or the mind. They take us away from our true nature. So these ripples are of four kinds. There's correct cognition, that is recognizing and knowing a thing to be as it is. And incorrect cognition is not recognizing and not knowing a thing as it is.
to give you an example we all believe that we recognize something to be you know what it is if i if i show you a, a mobile phone and you will correctly identify it as a mobile phone and that's not meant here that's not what they're talking about it's not about identifying such objects but if you meet a person you could like somebody who may be perhaps not a very good person and you have not recognized that this person maybe means you harm and that is what is meant here having a sharp buddhi being able to cut through things so correct cognition is linked here to buddhi to know something the way it is most of suffering comes due to incorrect cognition because we do not recognize situations people for what they are we mistake them for something else we mistake someone to be your well-wisher when he is not and you mis- may mistake somebody who is your well-wisher to be your enemy a classic example is for example in schools as a teenager teachers try to help the young students and the students get very aggressive they don't like being disciplined and they think the teacher doesn't like them in reality they are not recognizing who is really good they may follow the advice of their peer group their friends and end up doing wrong things following misguided advice getting into trouble because they followed the wrong people this is poor cognition incorrect cognition these two are very important because these come in every aspect of our life the third kind is imagination and abstraction these are words thoughts or ideas that do not have any material substance concepts such as freedom truth may be useful but they do not have a concrete reality or just imagination fantasy you may have an idea about what you want your future to be like you have a fantasy this has nothing to do with the reality so this is also kind of a vritti or these are the ripples in the lake they are vrittis there are five kind of vrittis correct cognition incorrect cognition then there is imagination fourth is deep dreamless sleep we all experience this every night we go through alternate cycles of dreaming and deep sleep and this is also a form of a vritti because it's a part of the mind it's a part of the unconscious mind and the fifth is memory recalling that which is cognized that which you have experienced whether it was real or imagined but without adding any thing from other sources so if it is real you have not created a fantasy around it if it's a fantasy it is your fantasy but it's a memory so when you remember something from your childhood or from the past it is the fifth kind of vritti or the ripple in the mind 
It's the fifth kind. So if you analyze your thoughts, you study the mind, you will find that every thought that you have falls into one of these five categories. Think of anything. And you can put it in one of these categories. Yes, are there any questions about this? What about emotions? Where do they fall in? Emotions also fall into one of these categories, whether they're correct cognition or incorrect cognition. Or the emotion as such, whether it's correct or not? Or... Yes, they, they come in. Sometimes emotion could be just imaginary. Then it comes in here. So they, they wow. fall into these categories, one of these categories, depending on the quality of that emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Radhika? Yes, Radhika? Yes. Uh, sleep is a place where we go every night mm -hmm. so is there any reason why uh, this is uh, given importance here yes it's extremely important uh, one is of course as i said we all experience it and that's where all the samskaras are stored that is that very deep layer of the unconscious mind and these are the samskaras which are in the seed form so they have not come up in the form of dreams. Now dreams, for example, come under the category three of imagination. So they have not, they're, they're deeper than that. So that's where the thoughts, images, everything is stored, but in a seed form. The thoughts come in the first category or second category, depending on whether they're correct cognition or incorrect cognition. Dreams come in the third category. Then there is, of course, a deeper level of, of deep dreamless sleep. Memory, if it is of any, depending on the kind it is, it is coming here. If you just fantasize a memory that, that never really happened, then it comes under imagination. So the deep dreamless sleep is important. It's not like that there is nothing. The experience of it is generally like nothing that's what modern science when they they study you you know they have sleep laboratories and then they will say there's nothing because there's no dream even dreaming stops so there's nothing but through yogic techniques and practice adepts can go into deep sleep consciously and they do not experience it as nothingness. They experience this as joy. Because it's at this point of time, at this state, that you, the, the ripples stop. So this is an important place. It is all the same, a part of the mind. It's not pure consciousness. It's still a part of the mind. And so it is simply one of the vrittis. But still, there are some seeds in deep, uh, dreamless state. Yes, yes, there are seeds. All the samskaras are pretty much there. They are there. They are not going anywhere until and unless you burn up those seeds. And then they are gone. But as long as they are there, these come under the category of vrittis. It's part of the mind. So we are analyzing okay. the mind here first. Right? You remember that okay. here we said that when the thoughts, emotions and everything subsides, then we see pure consciousness. It shines forth. But as long as all these thoughts, images, emotions, desires are active, we cannot see through them. 
it's like a veil you know it disturbs it it's all these ripples you can't see through the water when there are ripples on the lake right so these ripples are causing this disturbance in the mind the mind is the lake and there are so many ripples you cannot see that deep down there is this beautiful treasure this beautiful light it cannot be seen because of these ripples so we have to still the ripples so how do you still the ripples in order to still the ripples you first have to understand the nature of these ripples so these ripples or these vrittis as they are called in sanskrit are five kinds correct cognition incorrect cognition imagination deep sleep and memory and any thought you have you can think right now of anything random and you will see that you can put it in one of these five categories now in order to promote that state where pure consciousness shines forth we must learn to promote correct cognition that's the very first category here recognizing and knowing a thing to be what it is this is the cornerstone of practice this is a sharp buddhi this is what you need a very very sharp buddhi and that's correct cognition It's another word. Now, correct cognition is of three types. Once again, further explanation into this. One is direct perception. If you look at your mobile phone or your laptop as you are listening to this meeting, you are looking at it and you recognize it. This is a mobile phone. This is my laptop. That's direct perception. Inference. is knowing a thing through a thought process such as knowing the shape or size of an object such as you see a shadow of a person and you know okay here is a man you didn't see the man it was not a direct perception but you saw the shadow and that is called inference or you see the shadow of a house from that you can tell is this a big house is it a small house is it a um, a huge skyscraper is it a small little apartment block from this you can tell a lot of things from the shadow that is known as inference and then there is testimony testimony is knowing a thing through external authority this is an important point for a lot of students in the early stages because they do not have correct cognition in the area of direct perception or they are not able to infer correctly for example you see the shadow of a man how do you know for sure is the shadow of a man maybe it has a hat and some some big clothes it could well be it was a woman dressed as a man right you cannot tell from the shadow so this can happen even your perception can trick you so for a student in the early stages it's important to have testimony from an external authority from a teacher who has direct perception or who has knowledge through correct inference so when the first two are missing or are lacking it's always good to have the third we we do that very often for example when you go to the doctor you need an external authority when you're not well or you have a problem you go and get the advice of somebody else we do not like to do that in life asking advice from others because somehow in our modern society we have all been raised with good education and so we think oh i have studied 
I should be able to manage things on my own. If I ask somebody, they will think I'm a fool. So there is an element of ahankara there and we do not like to get external advice in matters of life. That is why sometimes in the West and even in modern India, gurus are treated as if they are, you know, leading cults or they are hypnotizing you, they want your money, is because this aspect of testimony through external authority is not acknowledged. It is very important though in the practice of yoga because when you are studying the mind, sometimes the mind is tricking you, the mind itself is tricking you. So you don't know if your cognition is correct or not. And that's when you need an external authority. Testimony. Any questions regarding this so far? Is it something like understanding this correct cognition? No, it's not understanding. Most of the time our understanding is like a, you know, intellectual thought process where we, we think, we think too much. But uh, just look at your mobile. How much understanding do you need to, to recognize that this is a mobile? Or whatever, you have a laptop in front of you. You recognize it, right? This is a laptop. Yeah. yeah. When you, you, you look outside and maybe you see a tree, you recognize it. There is no need for any real, you know, thinking process. It's a recognition. The seers, that's why we call them seers. They see something. It's a direct perception. You just see it and you know it. So sometimes mystics have said this is a knowing, it's an inner knowing. You know simply when something is right and something is wrong. Take for example, when you have to take a decision. Okay, now you may have to go to a party, to an event, you've been invited. Perhaps when you had to come for this online meeting, you had to decide, should I go for the online meeting or not? You just knew the answer. You know, it was like a snap here and you just knew the answer. Yes, I am going for it or no, I am not going for it. There was not a deep thought process involved. So it is just a, a direct perception is like seeing something and recognizing. Okay. okay. Sometimes I use the example of you know, when we are traveling in a foreign country and you meet somebody who looks familiar, maybe from your own country, <laughs> or you are outside somewhere and in the crowds you see a familiar person. You know the person. You recognize that person suddenly. It's that kind of quality. It's a quality of recognition. Okay? Okay, thank you. So, practice and non-attachment. These are the sutras 12 to 16. And they are about practice and non-attachment. You can see from these sutras that the very first chapter on the, on, about the Yoga Sutras, the very first chapter which is called Samadhi Pada, is actually very practical and if you observe yourself, you can see all these things in yourself. And so the study continues and now it also explains how should I deal with these ripples of thoughts. These are disturbing that lake of the mind. Yes, the mind is like a lake. 
and there are ripples and these are disturbing. So how do I calm down this mind so that these thoughts, these images, these emotions and desires subside? You do that with two things. These are considered to be the wings of a bird. Two wings of a bird. Practice and non-attachment. Abhyas and Vairagya. So, what is meant by practice? That effort or the energy you apply repeatedly to attain the state where the ripples subside is practice. So, here... We are not told what practice you are doing exactly. Remember that these are sutras. These are very short points or notes which have been made. And they were memorized earlier. They were memorized by the students. So they are just meant to jog your memory. You know, to, to help you hold the entire overview in your mind. So... It doesn't tell you the details of what practice you should do. But it says that effort and energy which you apply repeatedly to calm down your mind is called abhyas. And when that abhyas becomes firm, it's continued over a long period of time without break and with the right attitude, then it becomes firm. The details are to be discussed in chapter 2 and that chapter 2 is, is called On Practice. And uh, so of course one comes back to it. So here you get the first insight that practice is effort. Abhyas means effort that is applied repeatedly over a long period of time without break and with the right attitude. A lot of people practice, but very haphazardly, not regular. A lot of interruptions, a lot of breaks. And sometimes they don't have the right attitude. You cannot expect a result from a practice which is not undertaken over a longer period of time without break. And you can definitely not expect any result if the attitude is wrong. What is the second aspect? Is Vairagya. The mind, when the mind is naturally and effortlessly content, it is attracted neither to the external world nor has a desire for higher powers, which are described in chapter 3 of the Yoga Sutras. That desirelessness is called non-attachment. Sri Rama asks, what is the right attitude? Well, the right attitude is, why are you doing this? You are doing this to calm down the mind because you want to see and discover that wonderful treasure which is lying there within, within you, deep inside of you. That's why you want to calm it. So that's the right attitude. With humility, with, with respect, with sincerity. But if you are doing it because you want to get some siddhis, higher powers described in the text. Or because you want, you have, uh, your hankara wants, to, feeds on this wants to show how much he knows and what he's doing, you know. This is a wrong attitude. This is feeding ahankara. So, right attitude is done in the right spirit. Now, this utter desirelessness is one it's not attracted to the external world. It doesn't have desire for higher powers. It's just naturally, I'm sure that all of you are thinking about this and saying, oh, but you know, of course the mind is going outwards. 
some of you may say, oh, I, I, I like to go out and meet my friends. I, I like to go out and, and enjoy, you know, um, a nice dinner in a restaurant. I enjoy good clothes or, or, you know, all these material objects. It's not that you don't need to, that you should not enjoy the material objects, but the senses are not pulled outwards. And that is when this happens naturally. The senses, the mind is content. There's no doubt that this is not a uh, easy state to acquire and that's why we need abhyasa. That's what we practice. We are going to practice non-attachment and we learn that during meditation. When we learn it through meditation, it also spills over into our daily life. And there is a still higher state of desirelessness known as supreme non-attachment. So there's vairagya, there's param vairagya, supreme non-attachment. And in this, what happens? When we recognize that the ripples of thoughts, mental images, emotions and desires are transient and constantly changing, that our true nature is pure consciousness, this is the state of supreme non-attachment. Such a being makes no effort to use his powers. He will accept that there are all these thoughts, desires, emotions, that everything is changing in the world all the time. He does not get attached to anything. There is a great deal of misunderstanding about this. And the big misunderstanding is it leads to what we call neo It leads to people saying, Oh, I am Brahman, I'm pure consciousness, I'm not affected by anything, I have no desires. Simply saying that does not suffice. It is about the inner qualities. It's not about what you say and how you behave. By pretending to be detached, that doesn't make you param uh, To be supremely non-attached, you have to become a witness where you are always witnessing the mind. You are no longer identified with your thoughts, with your mental images, emotions and desires. Very often people think that in fact you're not supposed to have any thoughts or desires and that may happen for a while but the higher state is when you don't even get disturbed by the thoughts because you already are identified with supreme, with, with pure consciousness. So imagine you are, you're trying to subside these ripples of the lake, but you don't need to subside the ripples on the lake when you're already deep inside with that treasure which is at the bottom of the lake then it doesn't matter if there are ripples on the surface or not, right? Any questions about this?
Okay, I think everybody is contemplating and these are very deep matters. It's the study of the mind and uh, perhaps some of you may have questions um, which may surface later about it. To summarize this very shortly, we understood what is yoga as defined by the Yoga Sutras. We learned how to uncolor these thoughts by first understanding what kind of thoughts there are in the mind. The, basically the five different vittis, understanding these and understanding the nature of colored and uncolored thoughts. Is everybody clear about the nature of klishta and aklishta? Who colors the thoughts? Is it you yourself who colors the thoughts? Uh, yes and no. Uh, your thoughts have been colored also by your upbringing. So you were raised in a certain manner. And so the first ideas were put in by your mother. And... Uh, she said, uh, don't do this, this is not good for you. <laughs> do this, this is good, <laughs> this is bad. You know, when you tell little children, no, don't eat this, this is not good. And so these ideas of good and bad come from childhood. We are raised like this. In a sense, we are hypnotized. So it's the mother, then the father, the family, the immediate family. Then when the child goes to school... The, the teachers put in certain ideas. The other classmates will tell you, oh, this is good, this is bad. And so we always have certain ideas about how the world is. We like to think that all these ideas are our own. But if we study our thoughts, you will find that in fact, not even one idea is original. All the ideas were put in your mind by your family, your friends, by society. And then these ideas are challenged. We, we, we get upset. So in a certain society, some, certain things are considered good. In another society, they may be considered not so good. So when you move from one country for perhaps to live in another country that leads to a lot of turmoil because suddenly all these this this hypnotism or this programming is being challenged and we are we identify with these thoughts so if you are a, a woman you have certain ideas of who you are I, I'm a woman I'm smart you know I'm educated and somebody comes and questions these ideas and says, hey, you're not smart, you're not educated. I have an idea, you know, the identity, I'm Indian. So when you're in India, this identity is not questioned because you're surrounded by Indians. But the moment you come out of India and you come to, to Germany or to Singapore or to the US, then this identity is questioned. So these thoughts, these colored thoughts are like hypnotism or like a programming. And these are not really our thoughts most of the time. And it's these thoughts, these colored thoughts, which are leading us further away from our true nature. Mm -hmm. In meditation, the purpose is to look at our thoughts and understand what programming is useful and what programming is not useful? And that which is not useful, you, you say, okay, then I don't need this anymore. Useless. And the other stuff which is useful, you say, okay, I will strengthen it. And so those ideas which lead to this false belief that worldly objects will give us pleasure, everlasting pleasure, these, these create more suffering. So we want to uncolor those thoughts, those, those kind of uh, ideas. Mm -hmm.
Okay, yeah. Yes, this idea of uh, klishta and aklishta is very important for those who are meditating, who are learning meditation, they are seeing their thoughts, they are observing them, and at some point of time, one studies them carefully and promotes that which is useful, promotes those thoughts that lead us to a direct experience of our true nature and we try to um, disidentify ourselves from those thoughts which perpetuate a false belief system that all material objects are going to lead to pleasure or that... Um, our body and the mind is our true nature. For most people, the body and the mind is the true nature. They, they do not acknowledge anything beyond that. Okay. So can you speak a little bit more on the non-colored thoughts? Uh, yeah, non-colored thoughts do not exist. These are what we want. We, we want to uncolor the, the colored thoughts. So... All the thoughts generally are colored. It's only through a process of meditation that we uncolor them. Okay. Yes. So that's yeah. a longer process. And of course, we will be coming to that in chapter two, the, the chapter on practice. Okay. Yeah. So, of course, then there is understanding Abhyas and Vairagya. This is very important. This is what we are doing. And then in our next session, we will continue with, with this uh, very useful text for those who want some practical hints and suggestions and studying their own mind. This is an amazing manual for yoga meditation, for understanding the mind and how to lead it. Uh, deeper. It's not very useful if we just make an intellectual thing out of it. In fact, it's counterproductive, but it's very useful when we understand it here uh, in a very simple way. You know? Simple English, not no, no complicated academic language and no almost no Sanskrit. Okay, so um, we will continue next Friday, same time. And um, have a nice weekend, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.